So today's 60 minute presentation is on real world structural health monitoring, using data to make decisions. Our presenter is Geocomp project engineer, Dr. Ozan Selick. Dr. Selick has managed the structural health monitoring system for the Governor Mario M. Cuomo Bridge for New York State Thruway, which is the largest bridge SHM project in the United States. Ozan's areas of expertise are structural monitoring and design and condition evaluation for various types of structures, which he will be discussing in today's presentation. So everyone, please welcome Dr. Ozan Selick. Thank you, Julia, for the presentation. Uh, welcome to your listeners as Geocom family. Uh, today, we are really excited about uh, providing this, this webinar to you. Uh, and I personally am quite excited. Um, Today, uh, I would first be briefly would like to go over the uh, presentation outline that we will be delivering today. So our presentation will start by defining what structural health monitoring is. And I will uh, more often refer to this as SHM rather than saying structural health monitoring all the time. So we are going to define this concept from a discussion point of view as to what it is and also how it can help the clients and why we are doing structural health monitoring. Then we will move our discussion to defining a structural monitoring in, in, the context, in the context of active risk management and how it can help uh, to quantify our, our risks and manage our assets better. Uh, then we will talk about some basic steps of successfully, successfully deploying a structural health monitoring system. And we, in that, we will talk about some sensor types, the information and data we can get out of those, of those sensors. Uh, and also we will talk about some strategies as to how we can store this data and then how we can put it in a consumable form so that it's, it's, so, so that, so that it's not going to overwhelm the uh, audience. Uh, as we are wrapping up the presentation, we will go over some different applications because most of these uh, today's uh, examples will be out of the bridge world. But of course, when we talk about structures and monitoring, it's, it can be applied. The same idea and same, 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 same idea can be applied to mechanical engineering, aerospace, aerospace industry, and any, any, other, any other industry that we can make measurements. And then we, we will wrap it up eventually. Structural health monitoring, what is structural health monitoring? Structural health monitoring is basically a, can be, can be a thought in terms of doctor and patient analogy. Just like a doctor needs their uh, uh, diagnostic tools, we have our sensors. These sensors come in a singular type or a, you can, they can form a hybrid body by bringing most of different various types of sensors together. Eventually, just like a doctor collects data to make the, to, before making diagnosis, we collect data from our structure. Of course, the patient we are serving is not, doesn't have to be sick. It, it, it might just be an annual checkup, just like we are doing our long-term, short-term or long-term uh, structure, structural um, monitoring studies. So eventually what we are trying to achieve here is to identify problems if there is any, and then looking at the overall behavior, seasonal annual changes over, 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 the, over the long term. Uh, the beauty of structural health monitoring is that um, it makes our uncertainties quantifiable. Uncertainties in this context mean our risks. So civil engineering industry, of course, has uh, maybe is infamous of, of uh, constituting a lot of risks. So in order to turn them into our advantage, we have to make them, put them in a form that, that are quantifiable. And then eventually the data we are going to use out of these system can help us make decisions objectively. Why we need structural health monitoring? So there are several steps that we list here, but of course it can be, it can be a lot more than that. So we are, we are not limiting ourselves with only the ones that are listed in here. First, it can be taught in the context of validating performance. Nowadays structure are being, uh, being um, uh, designed with 50 year, 100 year design life. And also at the same time, these structures should endure uh, some extreme events, like extreme events like hurricanes, earthquakes. So, um, although everything works on paper, structural health monitoring is a great way of, of validating that performance. Also, at the same time, when we think about the structural health monitoring system that we can deploy at the beginning of a construction, and as we and 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 we develop that system as the construction progresses, we will have from the first day we may have an idea about the. Uh, 
overall structure, structural performance, and we can track of how the construction progress is progressing, and if everything is going according to the plan. If you have an existing structure uh, that you know you have issues with, or if you have an existing structure that you would like to lo uh, monitor long term, it also gives you and it also helps you to reveal the unknowns about that structure or define the root cause of, of your problems. If your structure is in, a, is in a condensed area with high population, a high you know populated city like New York, like Chicago, you might you might want to consider deploying such a system to, especially if your concern is is sudden failures. A real time uh, structural monitoring uh, program can help you can can actually warn you with such uh, if, if such when such problem occurs. Uh, also at the same time when you bring a lot of information from, from a network of structures or, or different components in a, in, in a singular structure, you will have an idea about how to better maintain your, how to better schedule your maintenance uh, program and eventually um, uh, make, make better decisions. Also at the same time, one overlooked point is that, uh, especially for, for, uh, for construction and controlling adjacent construction, adjacent neighborhood in, 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 in active construction areas, uh, the objective data coming out of um, structural monitoring systems can help you uh, making your case when it, when it comes to litigation issues. Here in GeoConf, we are big advocates of, of active risk management. So I would like to walk you through the steps of active risk management and how it can be associated with um, structural health monitoring or how SHM can be used as a tool for active risk management. So looking at the, looking at the pictures here, you might, you know, you are seeing different different type of structures that might have a bunch of uncertainties. If you have, let's say, a floating bridge on a on a certain on a, on, a, on a river, you you might have uh, maybe water or, or liquid structure interaction problems, uncertainties. If you are managing your wind farm, your wind your, your cracks on your wind blades or rotating machinery, its dynamic effects can be a problem. Here, if you are if you are if you are if you have a, um, different dams on your network. You might have problems, uncertainties with internal erosion or, or cracks in your in solid solid body. Or if you are looking at stadiums, pedestrian bridges, you might have problems with uh, human structure interaction or machinery uh, structure interaction. So these are the uncertainties we, we kind of list at the identification stage. Then we go on to assessment stage where we determine the likelihood of each risk element and the consequences or impacts of, of these. At the planning stage, we define the strategies to minimize likelihood and, and control sequences or impacts. And then, and then once we define our, our problems and once we have a certain plan, we can include, incorporate um, structural monitoring programs to measure things that can indicate and quantify risk, evaluate results, and update the risk assessment. Then we will move on to control stage where we take action to reduce those risks at every opportunity, because now the risk is quantifiable. We know how it's progressing. We know the situation. And then at this point, we take action to reduce those risks. And, and with the reassessment stage, we complete the cycle where we periodically review and update risk elements and action plans. So uh, making this a habit in our structural monitoring projects will, ha will help us greatly when, when reducing risks. Of course, uh, we have to talk about some uh, really important steps about uh, successfully deploying a structural health monitoring program. So everything starts with defining a solid, very well understood objective. Your, your, the, prog the, the, the success of your program is only as successful as how well you lay out your, your, your needs or objectives. You have to know your structure, you have to know your problems, you have to know what you wanna do. And then accordingly, you can, you can design what you need in terms of what sensor types you will need or what data acquisition units you are going to need to, 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 measure, to make that measurement effectively. At the, at the planning stage, um, you will, you will uh, think about how the deployment of this design will, will occur in the field. You will have to consider the access, some, actually some risk again, considering the, uh, how, how we are going to deploy, deploy the system in the field. Your, your ambient uh, conditions in terms of climate or, or the area might be a problem. Your, your accessibility to certain locations might be a problem. Uh, so all these things should be considered at the planning stage. 
then you will go to procurement stage. Now you have a, you have a very well-defined objective. You know you designed your system uh, and, and you have a plan how to deploy this in the field. But here, this is an important part because you don't want to sacrifice the quality of your data, the measurements. You want to work with people, vendors that you are really comfortable with, that you know that they, they, they have an experience and they, they very well um, prove that. And then at this stage, basically, you try, you try to make the best, cho best choice without breaking the bank. Then it comes to installation stage. Installation stage is quite important because you have to have very well documented quality assurance proce procedures so that every step of the way from the step, from the step you go into the, uh, to the field until you connect the, to connect the last sensor, you have to document everything so that whenever happens along the way, you will be able to, to whenever bad or thing, uh, problem happens along the way, you will have to identify it and then solve accordingly. Collection stage will be the point that you will have to decide how fast you need your measurements and also how effectively, you, effectively, effective plan, how effectively you can store that data uh, and what those strategies for data management will be. Uh, then you will go into evaluation stage. Evaluation stage is where you look at that data and then um, make sure that everything is accurate uh, and everything is, is, is working according to the plan. Interpretation stage is the portion that Basically, you decide if you are going to use this data uh, in terms of incorporating in the computer models, or if you are going to use this data in terms of just looking, do, doing some data-driven, they only purely data-driven uh, analysis. Uh, what reports you are going to create, what process, post-processing analysis you will, you will make. This is the stage that you will, you will, you will have to decide. And eventually, you will have to decide those wisely so that you can look at that data, that, that report, and it has to tell you something about your structure. And, and then accordingly, you can take action and then remedy those problems if there is any. Uh, here's a good example of identifying a problem, just like we talked about here, the first stage. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's the Cuomo Bridge example in New York. Uh, this is... Uh, are the largest bridge SHM project in the, in the nation currently. And at the beginning of this project, we were trying to answer three different questions mainly. The first is, how is my facility performing? Basically, uh, at the design stage, all of your comp components and overall bridge is expected to stay within certain limits uh, based on how the design is made, uh, considering serviceability and strength uh, requirements. So looking at the structural, uh, um, structural performance at the component level and, and overall performance of the structure using a structural monitoring program will, will, will assure that you are always staying in those limits. The second question we were trying to answer was, is extreme behavior occurring? So what do you mean by that? So if there is any uh, breach over those thresholds that we set, meaning uh, serviceability and, and strength limits, we will, event, we will immediately have to. We will immediately have the chance to know, know those, know those problems. Also, at the same time, whenever, whenever there is an extreme event occurring, like earthquake, like ship impact, like hurricane, uh, data. When you look at the historic record and or before and after, uh, the data will show you if if there is any extreme thing or any residual effects effects uh, being seen on its on its on its signature. And the, and lastly. Since you are looking at everything at the component level, you will have, especially for certain compo components, you will have the ability to, uh, to monitor tear and wear of that component. Uh, basically, especially for the, for the components that have a certain design life, certain fatigue life, this is going to be the, the point that you will be looking at that data and make, make accurate decisions. The second point was what measurements we should make. So, Again, based on what we are defining here as our objective, here what we are doing, what in terms of data collection and reporting. We are just uh, listing some of the things that we are doing here. Uh, and, and of course, it doesn't, whether it's like a single span, simple bridge, or uh, a, a network of bridges or a signature giant bridge, the idea is the same. Uh, and it can be applied to any kind of, pro any kind of example. So, uh, for instance, an acceleration measurement from various components can reveal information when it comes to frequency response. Frequency response meaning uh, 
the uh, uh, frequency shifts on your on your components or model shape changes over on overall your on overall structure. If you look at the seismic response of structure, or if you have some ground measurements, you can look at where your structure stands in in the design spectrum, or, or if there is any deviation from that. Cable vibration can reveal information about the force in your cables. Uh, also, at the same time, for certain members, uh, it can reveal in, it, it, can, it can work like a tilt meter and then give 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 an insight about if rotations are within the limits or not. If your if your intent is to do high sampling uh, measurements, you can look at the wire breaks in your st structure through through acoustic emission. Also, at the same time, by looking at the correlation of these measurements, you can reveal some damage damage information uh, regarding your structure. Strain is one of the most fundamental measurements we, we, we do for, for, for basically every structure. Uh, for, a, for a bridge uh, example like this one, it can reveal information about fatigue, it can re reveal information about principal stresses, and eventually it will allow us to compare them with stress concentrations. And also at the same time, when you install these sensors at, at, at certain locations along the girders, it can give you a, a information about load rating Overall, the on the on the entirety of the structure. Uh, also, at the same time, uh, if you have especially um, uh, bearings that are kind of earthquake resist resistance, acting like a uh, uh, isolator, you will you will want to you will want to have an idea about where they stand in terms of long term displacement, and if there is any detachment from the uh, from the girder that they are they are they are uh, they are basically uh, uh, laying under. Ambient weather measurements will give you information about tra daily traffic decision at the, and also at the same time uh, the, their correlation with, uh, with other measurements. If you have GPS network that you deployed on your, on your bridge, you will have a better understanding of long-term displacement. And, and, and one of the most important or uh, maybe the most controversial measurements uh, when it comes to our structures is corrosion. A corrosion map uh, and data coming out of several different sensors can give you an idea about where you stand in terms of corrosion progression. Again, going back to the first, the several steps we defined, we have to have, uh, before we go into the field and deploy any kind of system, <clears throat> uh, we have to have a, a clearly defined factory acceptance testing procedure. Here we are showing some, some of the examples for, for one, of, one of major projects. Here, here you see a GPS uh, system that we are basically uh, testing long-term before they go into the field. Here, uh, you are seeing a fiber optic, fiber brag rating system, uh, sensor, strain sensor coupled with temperature, temperature sensor being read through uh, a fiber optic interrogator, and also a weather uh, measurement system that you see that we are, we are testing in-house. So the importance of the, these test procedures is that, <clears throat> especially when you are forming a hybrid system with various sensors, various data systems that has different inherent characteristics, you want to make sure that they are working in harmony and you, want, you don't want to make, you don't want to have any surprises when it's too late uh, in, in, into the project. We talked about the planning stage and how it, important it was. Now we design everything like a normal uh, design of a, of, a, of a bridge project. We design all of our you know, schematics. We design all of our components that will go into the field. And then we also have to make sure that anything the design, anything laid out on the plan should be followed strictly according to the plan in the field. And this is only possible when we, uh, uh, when we follow a strictly uh, uh, laid out, very well-defined quality assurance, assurance uh, procedure. Each time you see something in the field, each time you install a sensor, each time you take a measurement, Wherever you think that a problem might occur, you have to record everything so that it will, it will assure things are going according to the plan. Here at, at this point, uh, we talked about some steps as to uh, until the installation of the sensors. And then now it's time for us to look into the several sensor types and then information we can get out of those in, this, in the context of civil engineering and then how it can help uh, the decision-making process. The examples here I'm going to explain here, of course, neither are limited to the sensor types nor, nor the structure because most of these are bridge examples. But again, like I said, it can be any type of structure. Here you are seeing uh, a 
two different sensors uh, in chronometers and displacement sensors and, and, and their data and what information we can get out of those. Basically, inclinometer is going to give you a rotation information, which is, which is quite valuable uh, when installed on a pier cap or underneath a deck, tumber, deck, deck member close to an expansion joint. It will definitely give you the information about the interaction of your peers with the, with the superstructure. And also at the same time, it will give you a valuable information about the, your soil movements. And if there is anything that you need to be, you need to be worried about. Expansion joints, uh, their performance, uh, their uh, daily cycles, uh, daily, mo daily movement cycles, annual seasonal movement cycles, and their accumulated cumulated, uh, movements along the, along the years will tell you about where you stand in terms of their design life. If there is anything uh, occurring after an extreme event, like for example, uh, the joint uh, uh, losing its ability to move uh, smoothly, you will definitely see that in, in the information you are getting out of these sensors. <clears throat> Here's an interesting example of uh, resistance-based training gauges. Uh, here uh, you are seeing an installation of these sensors on, a, um, on an expansion joint beam. Here uh, uh, our concern uh, was uh, tracking the uh, um, principal stresses around welding holes. For the structure also and eventually getting a getting an idea about how they compare to uh, stress concentrations that we considered around uh, in the in the design stage also at the same time by looking at the stress cycles uh, over time you will have an understanding about where this singular uh, component are standing in terms of its design life of course the application with these type of sensors is quite common and, and one of the you know, very most common examples is, is using those sensors in, in load rating studies. Corrosion sensors are, 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 great way of, are a great way of um, providing information about uh, uh, linear polarization resistance, open circuit potential, um, chloride ingress, or many other parameters that, are, that might be electro in, a, in an electrochemical sense that might be related to uh, tracking corrosion. So, uh, if you have a structure that you have a chance to deploy such systems, such sensors along the entirety of the structure and on certain locations, of course, defining a nice spatial distribution and wise spatial distribution of these sensors are also important. Then you do that from the first day of the construction. Uh, you can create a basically corrosion map of the entire structure. And then eventually uh, you will have the ability to track where the corrosion first starts, how it's progressing over time, and then if you need to consider um, any drastic action in terms of any replacement, any 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 um, other uh, corrective corrective remedial action. Bearing sensors, uh, bearing sensors, especially for for signature bridges, for you know suspension cable bridges, especially when around the points where the mid-span stands on the towers or where the uh, anchor joints are, uh, need to be monitored, monitored closely in terms of their uh, rotation and displacement. Especially when you consider, again, just like any, most of the components along the uh, around the bridge, around bridge structures, you have a certain design, design life for these, for these um, um, components as well. So, and also, there are certain demand ratios uh, kind of set forth by the engineer uh, that they need to stay in. These kind of measurements will ensure that we are always, no matter what the extreme condition is happening, ambient condition is happening around the structure, these sensors and these measurements will give you the ability to track those, especially when you have uh, earthquake resistance bearings such as um, you know, friction or pendulum type uh, friction, uh, isolators or, or, um, or basically um, rubber type of uh, isolators, you will have, you will, it's, it's very valuable to track the displacement so that you will always have that tolerance that can compensate for the earthquake. Interesting, interesting application of, of um, fiber optic sensors. Fiber optic sensors are superior alternatives to this traditional vibrating wire type or, or resistance type, type of uh, sensors. Uh, however, their use need to be justified because if you want to, they are, they are quite uh, uh, 
important when it comes to when if your concern is to have really accurate strain measurements and also if you want to go really high speed. Here in this example, you are seeing a stra strain and temperature fiber brag, brag rating couple installed on a ring nut around the stake cable, in a way acting like a giant load cell. So in a, a setup like this will give you information and then calibrated correctly, of course, will give you information about how your forces along the, along the lifeline of your structure is changing. If there is any break in your tendons, if there is any wear and tear in your tendons, you will be able to see those changes when you look at the historic record of, of your, of your uh, data. Also at the same time, think about these sensors being installed on a strand or on the wedge plate where the strands actually are kind of merged into the, on, 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 the, um, on the anchor point of that cable. So you will have an idea about the remaining life by looking at the stress concentration, stress cycles along the, along the um, life of the structure. GPS displacements are really handy when it comes to uh, tracking the overall motion of the structure in, in, in three dimension. Uh, based on how you are sampling your data, could be static, could be dynamic type of data, you can reveal different type of information. Um, when you look at the static type of you know, uh, measurements, the da daily seasonal and accumulated changes can, can reveal about the overall movement of your structures, especially it's valuable when it comes to uh, soil movements and how soil is interacting with your structure. Um, also at the same time, uh, it's, if there is an extreme event that's kind of leaving a, a residual effect on your structure, you will be able to track those by looking at those displacements. If you have the, chain, if you have the chance to to sample your data uh, in a fast pace, um, which eventually will maybe uh, result in, in, in loss of accuracy a little bit, but it can reveal great information about where your dynamic response, response of your structure stands in terms of, in terms of frequency shifts. Uh, also at the same time, when considered with correlation with other, uh, other effects like temperature or traffic, you will, you will be able to understand what is the significant deterioration uh, effect or force that uh, affecting your overall performance of your structure. Weather stations are, are quite valuable uh, in terms of uh, providing wind speed, wind direction, precipitation, temperature, and also visibility uh, data. Uh, these are used commonly and, and, and very often by the by DOTs to make uh, traffic decisions, especially in, in big cities where we have uh, really high traffic for commercial, commercial vehicles. These, these kinds of measurements should be done uh, objectively. And, and, and these, are, these measurements are great ways of doing that because when you have a weather station on a bridge installed such as this one, you will have a you will, you will have a really cl close proximity of what the, what the weather conditions are at that point and then make decisions accordingly. Also at the same time, just like I mentioned, each of these measurements can be correlated with, the, with any type of component data, expansion joints or tower movements um, and strain measurements. You can have an un understanding if the measure, different measurements of weather is affecting the component behavior or not, or at what level. Now we talked about a successfully deploying an SHM system and what kind and several type of sensors and how their data can be incorporated for decision making. Now this is the point where we are going to talk about how to manage the data effectively. So they, uh, the the buzzword or word group big data came out around early two thousands and when they defined big data, they also defined three Vs that goes hand in hand with big data, which is variety, velocity, and volume. volume. For structural health monitoring ap applications, the variety is basically the type of sensors and, and the different measurements you're co collecting out of your system. The velocity is basically how, you, how fast you are sampling your data based on your needs. And the volume is basically the problem of storing that data when it comes in large and large volumes, especially when, when, when sampled at high speeds. Uh, nowadays, actually, uh, uh, web cloud services are great ways of, of managing this type of big data because, because it allows the, allows the users to, to um, manage their data in large volumes 
in relational databases. These relation, the choice of this relational database can, can depend on the person and their needs because you can go with a traditional SQL database, you can go with another time series type of you know, inter, uh, different databases that will eventually work faster. So this, is, this, is, this will allow you to what type of uh, relational database you are going to choose. Again, uh, we, are, we are in the era of you know, electronics and artificial intelligence, so everybody would like to re reach that data on, on the go with any kind of smart device that they can use. But at the same time, of course, everybody will require to look at the data uh, without, any without seeing anything getting stuck and we'll be, they would like to be able to look at this, create reports out of this data that are meaningful and that they can generate in a short amount of time. Here at Geocamp, and this is just one example of doing that, we, are, we, are, we have a, uh, a web cloud service, a GIS-based web cloud data management service that what we call as iSight Central. Uh, the beauty of iSight Central is that it doesn't only give you a basically graphs or like correlation plots or statistical measures that you can look at, but also at the same time, you, it can give you an idea about everything that, that comes together in terms of um, a spatial sense. So you have a GIS map, just like a Google map. And then especially let's say that you are a, you are a person who is managing a, a tunneling project that goes miles and miles long, or you have an owner of several bridges you are an owner of several bridges that you need to monitor closely from one location. See, this, this uh, kind of cloud service is, gives you that ability uh, to, to manage all those together. And since you have, you have the ability to see all your measurements, all your projects, all your project-related documents in, in, in one platform, and also at the same time, you have the ability to introduce more information from, from services like weather, weather services around the nation or... or you know, other services that can do, you know, uh, ground motion measurements. You can, when you bring all those together, you can look at the correlations of these measurements. You can look at the, look at um, uh, useful reports or post-processing that you want to do. Anything can be implemented in, in, and, and, and stored in, in, in one platform, such as this one. When you introduce uh, high velocity data, when you have thousands and thousands uh, of a second um, sampling speeds, you also have to consider how you are going to st store that data and if you need that data high resolution all the time. So for most of our projects or for most of our, whenever we talk to our clients, sometimes they come across uh, from a place that they want all the data and because they believe that more data is going to make more, more kind of, they can make more sense out of that more data. But most of the time, less is more. So you have to have an intelligent way of, of collecting data and then, and then storing it. One way of doing this, and this is going back to Chrome example, although we are, we are introducing the gigabytes of data every day, we are not always storing this data at high speed. Uh, most of the day, most during the day, uh, and most of the time during the day, you are not going to be able to see more significant, significant changes in, in your structure. So you are not, most of the time, majority of data is not gonna be needed. Uh, but however, in certain parts of the day, for example, when the traffic is high, when traffic volume is high, or when you are expecting a weather condition, you may, you may want to look at that data in high resolution. So although we are collecting high speed data continuously, the way we store the, that, that data is all, almost always in terms of statistics, but whenever a user requires that data in high resolution, uh, they can get just by, uh, just by, uh, clicking a link on their, on their application, or you, uh, the clients can um, uh, set random triggers so that in certain times of the day, they can, they can collect, that, collect that data in high resolution. Also, although at the same time, you can, um, you can set certain thresholds to certain type of uh, uh, sensors uh, so that whenever there is a, whenever that, uh, um, threshold is breached, you will alert your system that something is, something is out of the ordinary. Now you can collect high resolution data. So this is just one way of doing that. But in, when it comes to data, data management and doing it effectively, especially for high speed, uh, this, is, this is an interesting way of doing that. Of course, we talked about the visualization and display of the big data and how it should not overwhelm the audience. Um, 
So first of all, in order the data representation is maybe one of the most important thing that that derives today's world today today's uh, big data world. Uh, so any any cloud service that you kind of encounter these days are one layer of another kind of advertising themselves in in terms of the the the, the effective data display options that they 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 need they are offering. Here for the industrial world, for structural industry world. Uh, a, I am just giving you an example right now of how we are, how we are doing it for bridges. First of all, like we said, you have uh, volumes and volumes of data that you are looking for. They are looking from a time window of five years, 10 years, 15 years. So you have to have a logic data tiering system, just like we do here, uh, so that you can, you can look at data and only the portions of that data that, that have significance in terms of performance. So by, by incorporating some intel, intelligent logic, uh, uh, you will be able to see a 10 year, 20 year long data without sacrificing the accuracy and without sacrificing the information that it constitutes. Uh, also at the same time, it will give you the ability to create your reports in, 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 in a short amount of time rather than waiting for, for, for minutes or hours. Uh, an example from, from the bridge industry can be, can be uh, some statistical calculations that you can get out of your measurements. And basically these are first or second moments of, of time series data that you are collecting. Average, mean, ma minimum, maximum, standard deviation, or, or, or any type of distribution will, will go into this in this uh, category. Also at the same time, you have, if you have a motion system installed on your bridge, it will give you, just like, just like the one you are seeing here, uh, it will give you a great information about of, about uh, where you stand in terms of all the trucks, cars going over your bridge. Uh, seismic analysis will give you information about seismic reports will give you information about the residual changes in your structure. Wind measurements will give you and reports associated with that will help you do traffic decisions. Corrosion corrosion map will give you um, ability to track the corrosion prog progress in your structure. Model, model response, of course, if you have a computer model, if you have your, know your model response, this is your chance to correlate the actual measurements with your computer model so that you can do necessary updating of your model. One interesting example actually nowadays becoming quite familiar, fam uh, uh, famous is bridge strike. So when you have a camera based sensor system in a, a deployed on a, on a railway bridge, you will, have to, you will have the ability to record everything whenever there's a bridge strike. Uh, on, on your on your on your on your asset, and eventually the correlation of all these measurements and reports will give you um, a good, good, great sense of how one component or several other components affecting each other and how, how their interaction interaction what their interaction means in terms of overall performance. Uh, so we talk mostly about uh, bridge world. Now we are going into some other examples. Uh, uh, some of these examples from like uh, from are going to be from uh, geotechnical world. Some of them are going to be from structural world. Uh, but again, the same idea is for can can it will, will be valid for every, every every type of. Whenever we say the word structure, it might have different meaning for different industry. But the measurement and then this, and then the the meaning will be pretty much the same. Um, this is an interesting project in New York East Side Access, which is still going on. Um, and this, in this project, uh, partly we work with ACOM and partly with Metropolitan Transit Authority. Our client was 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 uh, was those two uh, associations. And the the the, the concern what with, with this tunneling was uh, the displacement associate, associated with the excavation in in the tunnel and also uh, the, for the structures above the tunnel and around the around the vicinity. Also at the same time, the vibration levels occurring by the excavation and their effect on the surrounding structures was a problem that they, they, the client wanted to track. So here we did, uh, the, 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 the value we provided was to the client was to, to give them a real time, ability, give them the ability to, to give them the real, a real time um, tracking off of all these measurements, tunnel displacement, building displacement around the vicinity and a vibration measurement so that everything went according to the plan without sacrificing any, any quality and then without stopping the work. Or if there is any, any need to stop the work, they were able to do those decisions based on the data that we were providing. Uh, 
this is a ga uh, gas pipeline uh, example. Of, the, of course, with pipelines in general, the problem is always uh, either leaks or ruptures that can occur along the entire length of the pipeline. Here, um, a, a, an, an ex a, you can use different sensors, like for example, distributed fiber sensors, or you can use SAAs to look at the overall um, deformation changes of the pipeline. Also, look, you can look at the strains uh, and, and find out where which portions of the pipeline is kind of going underneath certain uh, uh, excessive stress. And if they need to go there and take a closer look in terms of if there is anything to do for on your side to, to make, um, to kind of in terms of taking remedial action and then mitigating your risk. Here is an alternative. It's, this is an interesting uh, application for distributed fiber sensors. Distribute, distribute, we've talked about earlier, we talked about fiber break rating systems. Fiber break rating systems, when you connect them to each other, they can act as an array. And in a way, they can look like a distributed fiber systems, especially if your concern is, is uh, high speed measurements. But here you are talking about, you are looking at a basically a singular fiber, fi fiber line which has multiple sensor sensing elements on it. And then basically you can look, you can measure the stresses and strains along the entirety of the structure with a really closely close spaced um, uh, distances. Here, by, by, by integrating this type of measurement with the cloud service system I, I showed earlier, we are able to look at the short and long-term deformation of the flood wall, as well as the levee. Uh, and whenever there's, there's an out of plane movement, out of the ordinary, um, and anything that the client needs, uh, needs to be, needs to be uh, warned about, the system was automatically raising those alarms and alerts so that they, could, so that they were warning them to, to look at that data accordingly. Uh, bridge moves are becoming, accelerated bridge uh, construction is becoming more and more popular. Actually, uh, this is, this is, we, are, we have one project coming up uh, in, 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 the, in the following months, but this is a project that I am, the one I'm showing you here is from uh, one of our earlier projects in Connecticut, I-84. Um, so here, the, the idea here is to build a bridge close to its final settling location and then move it without, uh, of course, at an early phase damaging the structure. So here our role was to, to keep track of the displacement and internal stresses so that at an early phase, the cracks will not occur, the, 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 the rota uh, torsional, out of the ordinary torsional mo movements would not occur. So as the SPMTs were moving the structure, we were in real time looking at the, all these parameters with the engineer uh, and the construction service, which is Northern Construction Services for this project. Um, we were able to stop, make decisions about the stopping the move uh, realign the structure and then moving, you know, safely move it into, into its final play, place. Especially considering the uh, catastrophic event happened in Florida, pedestrian bridge, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I believe the importance of these kind of uh, monitoring projects are becoming uh, more and more essential and important. One of the projects that we worked with Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and which we are proud of, is the Bayonne Bridge renovation. So the problems, not the pro maybe not the problems, but the things that we, they wanted to monitor were, were effects of the construction of new foundation. And, and of course, when they were raising the new deck, they wanted to look at the bridge geometry overall and if there were, there were any deviations from what's planned. Um, also at the same time, they had new loads that they wanted to transfer to the, to the piers and they wanted to make sure that uh, uh, those were not going over, over what were projected at the, at the design stage. So we looked at the displacement measurements and, and then gave, in real time gave an idea about if, if their concern was, uh, if, 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 if there's anything concern, uh, that they, need to, they had to concern about this bridge or not. A very important project that we worked with CME Associates and uh, Massachusetts DOT. So based on the condition uh, ratings out of, out of um, um, uh, subjective uh, local inspections, this entire viaduct, the original plan was to replace this entire viaduct. And, and the projected uh, cost was approximately $800 million. Uh, the cause was the problems were some uh, minor cracks uh, around, uh, along the web of the girder. And then, and then uh, the question was if the hanger plates 
on these girders were 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 uh, were at the limit of their design life or were were uh, working effectively or not. So what we did was to uh, install this bridge with strain sensors and eventually look at the uh, and eventually run a fatigue analysis on these members. By doing that, working with CME Associates, we we were able to predict the remaining service life of the structure. And then it turned out to be that uh, the that the the girders and hangar uh, uh, overall structure was not in a critical condition. And just by and only the only thing that they needed to do was um, was some minor retrofit around certain locations and the replacement on only the deck system. And that actually that entire project by investing only hundred and eighty thousand dollars in in, a, in an SH, SHM uh, program. MSDOT was able to save five hundred five fifty million dollars in this in this uh, significant project. Buildings and stadiums. Uh, this is an this is a example from a stadium. Um, here uh, we work with University of Northern Iowa, and the uh, they wanted to they did some renovations. Uh, the entire roof structure actually went through several re renovations, and then eventually they did deployed a snow melting system because the snow loads were, were eventually affecting the uh, kind of overall stresses of the, of the trust members. So what we did was to, to verify if the snow melting system was, was, was performing as designed. Also, at the same time, we wanted to make sure the stress levels are staying within the limits. So we did do a, a real-time monitoring system, and we set thresholds for certain sensors with the, with the uh, stress levels defined by the engineer. And then you know, in that way, we provided uh, a great service by in terms of keeping the facility open for scheduled events and allow for proactive roof maintenance. Um, also at the same time, um, we provided component maintenance to ensure long-term performance of monitoring systems. Payment instrumentation is, a, is an interesting example. Um, so basically, the way that national laboratories or or DOTs or airports would like to know, uh, the way that they want to know the thing that the things that they want to know about these these type of structures are basically this, the the performance of the subgrade and also at the same time the performance of the overall concrete or asphalt mix. So national laboratories are are quite famous in running accelerated payments. Uh, uh, accelerated payment payment programs uh, experiments. Uh, which make they make use of payment instrumentation. Also, at the same time, uh, the uh, DOTs and uh, airports, when they are going to build new payments, uh, this is their go-to. This is generally the, their go-to uh, practice, I would say, uh, for for assessing the performance. So here, the value we are providing is basically uh, the verification of new payment designs. And if there is any shortcoming in that design that's de deviating from their from their computer models. They can go back and uh, check their model and then come up with new design. Uh, also, by integrating some sensor triggered, just like the, the thing that we, we mentioned, the data management part portion of the of the of the, um, of the presentation, we can look at we can create a system that's uh, computer vision integrated or sensor integrated, and only trigger the system to collect the data whenever there is a need. Um, so that the audience is not going to be overwhelmed and will only look at the data that they need. So we are wrapping up our presentation. Uh, uh, the things that we went over today was basically uh, the uh, risks and uncertainties that the civil engineering industry in general constitutes and how structural health monitoring can help mitigating those. And then some effective steps in terms of uh, deploying a structural health monitoring program and then how we can make an active data management, how we can provide an active data management so that we can turn the data in a consumable form and then make the best out of it. So uh, here we have like uh, five key points we defined. So we talked about the plan where we define the purpose and requirements for each instrument. And then the instrumentation and monitoring, basically planning, design, and installation phase, where we install a reliable system to gather data as needed. So when you look at the data, you are sure everything is correct, and you are not scratching our head if, 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 the, reliable, if the data is reliable or not. The evaluation stage, 
where you identify and remove the invalid data, basically data cleansing, so that you will only looking at the portions that are statistically significant. And then the interpretation stage, determine what the data mean and what action is required, or if, if any action is required. And then finally, maybe the most important part is to respond. Uh, whenever you feel like data is telling you something, uh, you have to go and take action. And then again, go back to your office and then look at the data after that remedial action and see if it's, if, if what it's changing and if, there's, if the concern is still going on. So these are the things that I'm going to talk today. Thank you so much for your time again. I'm slightly over time, I believe. I, I apologize for that. Uh, but I think this is the portion that we can uh, try to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, Ozan. That was great. So we do have a few questions that came in through the Q&A tab, but also through the chat. So um, I'll read a couple of those uh, and we'll try to get through as many as we can in the next few minutes. So um, on an existing bridge retrofit, how much baseline data do you typically desire to determine normal bridge behavior prior to construction? Um, so basically, um, the, the, ideal, the ideal thing is to look at, collect some data, especially in a, in a, for, for, for a time window that you are going to a seasonal change. For example, going from fall, for going from winter to, or fall to summer to fall or fall to winter, so that uh, at least you will have an idea about the temperature effects on the structure. Because most of the time, uh, temperature effects are deemed to be the most significant. Uh, of course, every structure is different, but are for, for, for especially suspension bridges, cable stay bridges, they can be deemed to be, have the most significant factor in terms of structural displacements. So in order to see that effect, I would say at this uh, three, four months of data, of course, more is better <laughs> in that at least a year of data is better. But uh, three or four months of seasonal data that shows seasonal change will, will uh, be quite useful. Um, if that's a completely new structure that we are looking at, of course, uh, you know, when you start, you start with building the piers first, right? And then uh, at that point, the things that you can do are not very, you know, uh, diversified. You can start by uh, deploying some corrosion measurements and, you know, make a baseline reading out of those corrosions. Or you can immediately start, as you start, as you start the several, you know, lifts of your piers and then towers, you can start deploying some tilt me measurements and then look at how the construction progress is affecting the soil behavior and then settlements. So for a completely new structure, uh, I would say the data is going to be very, 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 is going to vary a lot. But if for an existing structure, I believe seeing a seasonal change will, will be very useful, which is probably three to five months. Of course, the, the need, if the need is immediate, like load rating, then you don't have to worry about anything. You just have to go and run your test. Awesome. All right, here's another question. Would you think these principles apply to monitoring structurally enhanced embankments, i.e. geotextile reinforced earth worms? Of course, uh, actually one of the, uh, you know, we talked about the structures here, but uh, uh, we have a probably, I would say more than 30 year experience on just the structural uh, instrumentation and monitoring. Um, so a, any type of geotechnical structure can be, can be um, measured with different type of sensor technologies uh, by, by looking at different measurements, for example, if, you're, if you are looking at um, the, uh, let's say, embankment, or, or if you are looking at the behavior of an MSC wall, or if you are looking at, if you have an ongoing, ongoing construction and if you are considered about the adjacent movement of your soil, you can basically uh, deploy um, SAA measurements, which are in a way in kilometers, and then try to predict uh, the movement of the soil is also at the same time by doing an automated uh, survey study you can look at how the displacement of certain points along the along your landscape is changing also you can look at, at like you can deploy several pressure cells and then um, if you have let's say if it's an MSC wall and if you are reinforcing strips 
you want to make you want to make sure those strips are are working as they are supposed to just by installing several strain sensors you can look at the performance of those uh, so there are many different things that you can do and that's why actually we would like to come out of place where we say we, we don't want to always say structural we always say geostructural because without the foundation there's no structure and they're always interacting with each other that's why we always use like the term geostructural monitoring and engineering awesome Okay, so we have time for maybe one or two more. Um, we are getting quite a few. So here's the next one. When you use high resolution monitoring, such as dynamic fiber optic strain measurement for earthquake response, how could you balance the high data flow and long waiting time for the earthquake? Uh, so basically, uh, I'm, I don't know if I'm understanding the question, but I believe uh, maybe the question is in terms of how we, if you are collecting. Um, so basically, I'm going to try to explain the way I'm understanding it. Uh, so I think the concern is he, here is, you know, continuously co collecting the data as when there's an earthquake and then and, and then um, and then basically storing that data. Uh, so if we are if we have for example seismographs on on the on the on the ground that we are measuring we are all always looking at the response to to go through so to go over a certain threshold so when there is a breach of that threshold we are collecting the data certain with a time window that's before that event happened and after that event happened so we make sure that the entire record is preserved also at the same time since all these timestamps are common through a a network time protocol and all, everything is in harmony in terms of little time steps you can also look at you can also take the same information from a component in the structures acceleration information and then look at how that ground record is actually or the spectrum that you are going to create out of that uh, that uh, seismograph is really accum uh, correlating with that actual structure structural measurement because at the end of the day, what you get from seismograph, you get you create a design spectrum with, by defining, you know, several single degree of freedom systems, and then you define and you uh, exert that rec record on your structure and see how your structural displacements are changing. So when you have both records, uh, you will be able to make a correlation. And and again, the key here is to create, uh, collect, the st collect and store the data before it happens and after it happens so that you have the full record. I, I hope I was able to answer the question. Yeah, we, and we'll, um, we also will have people contact you directly too oh, yeah, if they have a, more um, kind of in-depth questions. I think we have time for one more. So what is the lifespan of the sensors? Expecting to be shorter than the lifespan of the structure, are they replaced periodically? Um, so like every, so when you look at FHWA uh, bridge inspection manual, uh, sorry, RFT bridge inspection manual, uh, there are well, most of the time, if I'm not mistaken, the, these inspections are limited to every two years. So just like any other structural component, uh, when you, if you have applied the correct measurements to protect these sensors, uh, out of from env environmental effects and which we define in terms of IP rating, IP 67, 68, we wouldn't expect any problem. Uh, if, if, the, if, the pro if the sensor is installed correctly, if you applied, and these are very well identified and, and you know, right nowadays, maybe, maybe this question is coming out of some bad experiences that happened regarding structural health monitoring in the past, but nowadays, all the technology in terms of measurement and protection have developed significantly. So uh, with the correct, very well uh, laid out procedures, the sensors can, long, can last quite long. Uh, and then um, just by an inspection once a year, once every two years, although as long as you are not, you're not gonna see any significant problems out from the data, they, they can go on for long years. A good example of that is that five bridges that we are monitoring in, in, in Michigan, we have bridges that we monitor as long as 20 years, just by once, and we go there once in a year, just to look at how the structure, how the, uh, if, if there is anything, you know, out of the ordinary, but most of the time we just go there and come back without doing anything. 
So as long as they are protected, yes, it can go, it, they, those sensors can go for decades.